Today, we're exploring a Civil War battlefield in the heart of the Land of Enchantment. Hi, I'm Sky Omar Thaler. Welcome to another episode of Rooftops of America. Today, we're at the Pecos National Historical Park, home to the highest battlefield here in the United States. But before we go off on this adventure, take a moment to click that red subscribe button below and the bell icon next to it for all the latest Rooftops of America updates. Throughout its history, the United States has seen a lot of conflict. Battles have been fought in almost every state of the country. Of those taking place in mountainous terrain, most occurred in the East. One of the most pivotal battles in American history occurred at Kings Mountain in South Carolina. But if you are looking for the battlefield with the highest elevation, you will need to head west. One of the things that is so interesting about the U.S. Civil War was the scale of the conflict. It was massive. Battles and fighting occurred in over half the states of the modern day US, including the District of Columbia. While a majority of the fighting happened in Virginia and Tennessee, it impacted the entire country. And few people would realize that there was fighting all the way out in here in New Mexico, less alone a decisive battle. When the Civil War broke out in April 1861, the territories in the West and the modern day states of Arizona and New Mexico were split on the 34th parallel. The northern part stayed in Union hands, and the southern section became known as Confederate Arizona. While the Confederacy had a foothold in the West, they weren't content to sit idly by. They had plans for expansion, and those would take the shape of the New Mexico campaign. Now this wasn't some fool's errand, because at the beginning of the war, this would have been a low risk, high reward scenario. The materials out here were extensive. Over 6,000 rifles, dozens of cannons, most of it here at Fort Union. On top of that, there was a recruitable population with southern sympathies. And the icing on the cake was that the Union morale was thought to be abysmal. The objectives for the New Mexico campaign were ambitious. Seize the forts and war materials in New Mexico. Capture Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Move into Colorado to seize the recently discovered gold fields, then strike at California to gain access to the harbors there and bring them into the Confederacy. If successful, the campaign would force the Union to redirect manpower and the Confederacy would gain supplies and men for the fighting back east. And it would bolster their treasury and finally allow them to circumvent the Union blockade. It had no room for air, so it required both audacious leadership and careful planning. In addition to Union forces, the campaign faced other challenges as well one in the form of the terrain of New Mexico and the American Southwest in general. More than any other campaign in the Civil War, the New Mexico campaign revolved around logistics. Campaigning and fighting in this rugged, remote, and unforgiving terrain required a lot of support in the form of animals, wagons, and equipment. Water and food were not easily available, so foraging or living off the land was not really a viable option. The ability to resupply would be one of the critical factors that would determine the success or failure of this campaign. It was absolutely essential that General Sibley and his men be able to seize the supplies in the forts along the way in order for him to sustain his army. Another challenge was the state of infrastructure in the territories as well. Everything an army needed to maintain its combat effectiveness would have to be transported along with it. In the mid-1800s, New Mexico's infrastructure was basically non-existent. Roads were few and there were no navigable rivers. In order to move men, animals, and equipment required careful planning 
and executing it had to be done in detail so as not to overwhelm the region's capabilities. The man who would lead this campaign was Henry Sibley, a career soldier who resigned his commission in the U.S. Army and joined the Confederate cause. Prior to the war, he had been stationed in New Mexico and had been the commanding officer at Fort Union the year before. Despite these advantages, General Sibley was exactly the wrong man to lead this effort. A known procrastinator, those traits were compounded by chronic bouts of illness and a fondness for drink. Despite these shortcomings, Sibley raised a brigade in Texas of mounted soldiers with supporting field guns. The start of the campaign worked in the Confederates' favor. They invaded New Mexico with a force of 2,500 men and 15 pieces of artillery. The first goal of the campaign was seizing the stores at Fort Craig. Opposing them was a force of regular Union troops under the command of Colonel Edward Canby, a Mexican-American War veteran and the overall commander for the District of New Mexico. Canby would augment his force with volunteers and militia, bringing it up to a strength of 3,800 men. When Sibley arrived at Fort Craig, he quickly realized that he could not directly assault the fort itself. So he decided for an alternative, move north, cut off the fort's supply lines, and hopefully draw the Union troops into battle. Sibley's gamble paid off. The Union forces emerged from the fort and engaged the Confederate Army at Valverde. Over the course of the day, the battle went back and forth, with neither side gaining an advantage, until the Confederates were able to capture one of the Union artillery batteries. Canby opted to withdraw his forces and retreated back into Fort Craig. Valverde would be the largest and furthest westernmost battle of the New Mexico campaign, but it would prove to be a hollow victory for Sibley and his Confederates. They were unable to beat the Union Army decisively, and they were in no position to assault Fort Craig. And furthermore, on top of that, they were in a precarious situation with only a week's supplies remaining. Sibley made the choice to leave the Union Army penned up in the fort and to continue his advance north into the New Mexico interior, with the next objectives being Albuquerque and Santa Fe, with the hopes of finding much needed supplies. When the Confederate forces arrived in Albuquerque, they discovered a supply depot that had been burned to the ground. And the situation would be no better in Santa Fe, with the supplies there being removed or destroyed as well. Still, Sibley was able to purchase or confiscate around 40 days worth of material, enough for his army to continue the campaign. But now it was imperative for him to move forward and capture Fort Union. And in order to do that, the Confederate Army would have to march through Glorieta Pass. Glorieta Pass lies between the Sangre de Cristo Mountains to the north and the Glorieta Mesa to the south. Over the millennia, Alpine melt, and the Pecos River stripped away the sedimentary layers of the mesa, carving out the pass. The pass today is a lot more overgrown than it would have been in the mid-19th century, where settlers and travelers would have cleared out most of the woodland. This pass has long been one of the gateways to New Mexico. Historically, it connects the upper Pecos River Valley in the east to the upper Rio Grande Valley in the west. And over the centuries, it's been traveled by Native Americans and then later by Spanish settlers. By the 1800s, the Santa Fe Trail ran through here. It was the main road in the region and had, due to its importance, been well maintained by the military. It was the only viable route Sibley's army could take if it was to capture Fort Union and then make the push into Colorado. Meanwhile, the federal forces back at Fort Union had been busy as well. They'd recently been reinforced by a full regiment of Colorado volunteers who had traveled over 300 miles from Denver to the fort in early March. The commander of these forces was Colonel John Slough, and upon his arrival at Fort Union, he would assume command of the entire Union force there. While Colonel Canby, the overall Union commander, 
had issued a warning about not leaving Fort Union undefended. Slough felt the best defense for the fort would be to advance towards Santa Fe and engage the Confederates in the field. By the middle of March, the Confederate Army was on the move. A thousand men under the command of Lieutenant William Scurry had started to move up the Santa Fe Trail to head east towards Fort Union. In addition, he had a vanguard of 300 men under the command of Major Charles Pyron, ranging ahead of the main force. Together, it was a combined total of 1,300 men. The remaining bit of the Confederate Army was actually with General Sibley back in Albuquerque guarding critical supplies. On March 22nd, on the eastern side, Colonel Slough started to move his 1,300 troops and eight pieces of artillery. Perhaps the easiest way to look at this particular battle is through the lenses of the three ranches impacted by it. There's the Johnson Ranch on the western side, the Kozlowski Ranch on the eastern side, and the Pigeon Ranch right in the middle. Before the war, these ranches had served as way stations, providing respite and supplies for travelers on this part of the Santa Fe Trail. They would each play a role in the upcoming battle. By March 25th, Pyron had heard enough rumors from travelers on the Santa Fe Trail that a Union force was on the march. So in order to give his smaller force an advantage, he decided to move them up into Apache Canyon. And by that evening, his entire force was encamped at Johnson's Ranch on the western side of the pass. A day earlier, on March 24th, the main Union force had reached Bernal Springs. Major John Chivington was ordered to take a combined force of 400 Union infantry and cavalry and scout ahead, with the intent to locate the Confederates. By the evening of March 25th, Chivington's force had made camp at Kozlowski's ranch at the eastern entrance of the pass. That night, both sides sent out parties to gather intelligence, but the Confederate one was captured by the Union giving Chivington key information on his foe. The following morning, both sides were anxious to seek out the enemy. But in their haste, neither Chivington or Pyron decided to inform their superior commands of their intent. Both groups were on the march by 8 a.m., though the Union troops were moving quicker. Chivington passed by Pigeon Ranch, crested the pass, and proceeded into Apache Canyon. Pyron only made it two miles into Apache Canyon on the western side before he stopped and sent some of his irregulars ahead to find the Union force. It would be the Confederates who'd be found though, as Chivington's force came around a corner and captured several of them. Chivington moved quickly, deploying his men across the Santa Fe Trail and then proceeded to advance in the Confederate position. In the ensuing fight, Chivington's men initially were not able to gain the advantage, and Pyron was able to withdraw his forces to a more defensible position. Chivington attacked again. This time, his flanking maneuver and cavalry charge yielded results, capturing 71 Texans and forcing Pyron and his men back to Johnson's ranch, where they fortified their positions. Losses on both sides were similar. Four or five dead, with 20 wounded. Even though Chivington had the advantage, he didn't know where the main body of the Confederate Army was. So exercising a degree of caution, he withdrew his men to Pigeon Ranch to regroup and await reinforcement. It wasn't until that evening that both commanders finally informed their senior commands on what had transpired. By nightfall, the main Union body was camped at Kozlowski's ranch and news of Chivington's victory in Apache Canyon had spread through the ranks, providing morale boost for Union forces. Both Slough and Scurry expected battle the next day, so they hurried to consolidate their forces. But on the dawn of March 27th, no attack came. On the morning of March 28th, Colonel Slough decided to push the attack. He expected the Confederate force 
to maintain their positions on the western end of Glorietta Pass. So he ordered Chivington to take 500 men up onto the mesa to the south, work their way down, and then flank the Confederate positions at Johnson Ranch. In the meantime, Slough himself would take the remaining 800 men and move through the pass. This was a miscalculation, because Scurry was not content to sit still. He too wanted to press the attack, and he pushed hard up the canyon with his 1,300 men, advancing faster than anticipated, leaving behind his wagon train at Johnson's Ranch, with only one cannon and a handful of men to guard it. Slough's forces would step off from Kozlowski Ranch at 9 a.m. and move up towards Pigeon Ranch. When they arrived, they started to regroup and reorganize. It was at that time that the advance pickets from both sides made contact and started to fire on each other, kicking off what would be the decisive battle of the New Mexico campaign. Slough quickly formed a relatively strong defensive line, though throughout the day, Union forces would slowly give way reforming several defensive positions as they yielded to the numerical superiority of the Confederate force. Knowing he was outnumbered, Slough dispatched a messenger to order back Chivington, but was unsuccessful in locating him. On the other side, the Confederates repeatedly attacked the Union lines, though they were unable to break them. Scurry himself led direct assaults on the Union center, but both fell apart due to withering cannon and rifle fire. Eventually, Pyron broke through on the Union right, and the third assault breached the center of the Union line. Slough would then pull his troops back and create yet another defensive position. By that time, darkness was closing in and both sides were exhausted, which brought the day's events to a close. In the evening, Slough would pull his forces back to Kozlowski's ranch, leaving the field of battle to the Confederates. Their victory was short-lived though, because Scurry soon got word that the mortal blow of the entire New Mexico campaign had already been struck. While Chivington's troops had missed their opportunity to attack Scurry's flanks during his advance, they were still on the mesa heading towards Johnson's ranch. By luck, Colonel Manuel Chavez and his New Mexico volunteers discovered the lightly defended Confederate supply train, and then managed to convince Chivington to attack. Chivington and his force made their way down the mesa and attacked the undefended baggage train. They killed or ran off any of the few guards, they spiked the canyon, and then proceeded to run off or kill 500 mules and horses. Then, most critically of all, they burned the 80 supply wagons. This was a catastrophic blow to the Confederate force because without these supplies, Scurry would no longer be able to advance on to Fort Union and was forced to retreat back to Santa Fe. The Union managed to turn what at best could have been described a draw at Glorietta Pass into a strategic victory, and Slough had successfully defended Fort Union. Sibley and his Confederate army would be unable to continue the campaign and began a long and dangerous withdrawal back to Texas. The New Mexico campaign was the only attempt the Confederate states made to open up a new front in the western theater of the war. With hindsight, it could be considered a chaotic affair. In order for the campaign to achieve its strategic objectives, absolutely everything needed to go right for the Confederate forces. And almost from the start, they did not. It's always interesting to play what ifs, but I think it's safe to say that the Battle of Glorietta Pass merely sped up what would have been the end result of the New Mexico campaign. The rugged terrain here was never going to be able to support a Confederate occupation. And there were other challenges. There'd be hostile native tribes that the Confederates would have to deal with. Plus with the California column, already on the march, any gains the Confederates made would be in serious jeopardy upon their arrival in mid-1862. In the end, it's just too ambitious of a plan for too few men in too harsh a land.
These days, the Battle of Glorietta Pass is a footnote in Civil War history, if it's even remembered at all. It's been given the nickname, the Gettysburg of the West, though that suggests something much larger in scale than what actually occurred here. In one aspect though, that nickname has merit. This battle was decisive. It changed the face of the Civil War. It was the first significant loss of territory for the Confederacy. And more so, the West, with all its advantages and resources, would forever remain closed to the South for the remainder of the conflict. To visit the battlefield, first stop in the Pecos National Historical Park, a great site in its own right. Once there, you'll need to ask for the access code to get past the gate to reach the battlefield site. There's a 2.3 mile interpretive trail that provides an overview of the battle. To reach the memorials, you need to drive a short distance further along New Mexico Highway 50 to Pigeon Ranch. It's a shame this battlefield is so overlooked because it's unlike anything in the U.S. Civil War, both in the terrain and location it was fought at. At 7,500 feet, the battlefield at Glorieta Pass is the highest battlefield in the U.S. If you're ever passing through this way, make sure to stop and check it out. I'm Scott Mara Thaler. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Rooftops of America. Remember, click that red subscribe button below, and I'll see you soon.